Yeah, we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably make a start. Um, so welcome everyone to um, this. Uh, is it research live research live live seminar um, on the topic of developing a sustainable approach to managing digital research output. So <laughs> that where you think you are, <laughs> jump up um, if not. So my name is um, Rachel Thompson and I'm um, a Professor of Childhood and Youth Studies here at the University of Sussex. I've been here about three years now um, and it's very nice of Jane to um, invite me to chair, I think partly because I've been um, the annoying the library by asking questions about if we did this, if we made this kind of digital output, what would that cost for? How could we think about, does it mean, say, it's, um, we promise it will continue after five years, after ten years, after whatever and ever, those kinds of questions. So um, I think I've been drawn in in order to engage in some collective learning with everybody else about what these new questions about digital outputs really involve um, and, and entail. I've also got, um, I'm very happy to, with um, Tim Hitchcock here, and other colleagues, David Depp Ferry and um, Caroline Bassett and Sarah Jane Norman, to be part of the new University of Sussex investment in digital humanities, which is in the process of forming and already been launched from um, uh, September. Yeah, officially launched from September. So there's a process going on in terms of that, which is one way that the university is expressing its. Um, its uh, Commitment to this area, um, and we have a, you know, some really important collections here already. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, we're, it's, this is an area that the university understands as being one of the things we do and have the potential to do well in the future. So um, it's great that there's good um, good people here to um, to listen to the speakers, um, who are Neil Brindley from JISC, and Neil is head of resource discovery, which is. Uh, very oblique title. <laughs> I'm sure we'll, ha we'll hear a lot more, but he knows an awful lot about <coughs> the value of digital um, objects and um, the, the complications of that. So it would be really useful to, to hear from him. He's going to speak second. We're going to start with Chris Warren, who's a lecturer here in, um, in well, I'll say French history. I think it is yes. French history, yes. yes. Um, with wide ranging interests from um, uh, the uh, youth culture and um, Paris 68 through to resistance stories and he's part of a, um, an endeavour at the moment which is to set up a digital collection around resistance narratives or something of the kind. He's going to speak a bit more. So Chris will start and very much talking about the researcher end, the academic end of you know, have, having a, a project thinking through issues around us and then they'll we'll, we'll pick up um, some of the more kind of strategic um, archiving, curating questions. We'll have some time between for some yeah. of questions, but we'll aim to spend at least the last half an hour in conversation. So I'm sure people in the room have a lot to contribute. Yeah, so. Okay, so Chris, do you like to begin? Yeah, uh, I should start by saying I'm not an expert <coughs> in this. And I've been, I've been asked to do this, I think, just because I'm involved in trying to get this digital archive project up and running. So, um, and I've, I'm here to just talk about some of the issues that there is and try to do that, some of the practical problems I've, that I've been facing. And therefore, I'm really here to, to get advice from, I can see people are really not very better at this than I am. So, uh, and to put it in the context of where the university is heading and see what we can arrive at. So, in order to do that, I want to um, talk first about the archive resistant testimony, which is the official name of what we're doing. Uh, so I'll explain what the project is and put it into context. Then I'm going to talk about what I've set the practical goals I've set to myself around digitising this archive and talk about some of the problems that have arisen under heading format laws and then the question of the Okay, so just to put the archive of resistance testing in some kind of context, it's a part of a wider resistance studies initiative at the university, which is dedicated to promoting research, teaching, and public outreach on all forms of historic and contemporary resistance. So that's the third. But what, why the focus on testimony in particular? Why are we interested in, in life history and, and, and stories and so on? Um, I think the first, as, as a historian, I'm going to answer this question historically. 
there's a, 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 in terms of resistance history, there's a definite historiographical turn around the 1970s towards testimony as a way of understanding what's going on. So, there have been efforts to, particularly in the 1960s, to explain why people got involved in resistance in occupied Europe in sociological terms or in political terms, and these explanations were largely unsatisfactory. They did not explain why certain groups got involved and why certain similar groups did not. So to give the example of someone here at Sussex who really promoted and pushed this, this paradigm shift, Rod Kedwood, who is the foremost historian of French resistance uh, during the Second World War, talks about how in the late 60s and early 70s, he's one of the first historians to take seriously the idea of interviewing former resistors and going to ask them what, the, what happened and what they've done. He had to overcome a, a great degree of scepticism, particularly amongst the French historians who were doing work in this area. First of all, they were tended to be treated, he, he was interested in, in, in interviewing uh, peasant resistors, rural resistors, he was interested in particular. Too often, they were, they were treated, these peasants were treated as sort of fabulists, as people who just made stuff up, they weren't trustworthy, so their stories were de facto unreliable, they had nothing to say. But not only that, it was considered they were too close to the events, they were, you know, the fog of war, right? They couldn't see the bigger picture, they couldn't see the strategic importance of resistance. So it was useless going to ask them what resistance meant. Um, and, you know, there, is, there was a tendency, and probably still is, for historians to trust the paper archive rather than the living archive, um, and certainly not true in the late 60s and early 70s. So, why did Rod Kevin in particular develop this commitment to using testimony? He became convinced that the, there's a way of overcoming scepticism about their actual historical reliability by the more you accumulate, the more you put next to each other, the more you triangulate, the more you can eliminate or take account of those distortions or those misremembrances and so on. You then place that oral evidence next to the archive evidence and, and interesting things start to emerge because it's obvious that the contemporary record that historians are so diverse to is itself subject to blind spots and omissions on the part of those who are recording things at the time. So Rob was able to uncover aspects of resistance that contemporary observers at the time had not thought important or had just not, just not understood because it wasn't in their frame of reference. And it only became apparent in the subsequent memory and subsequent life of his uh, interviewees. So the, the, the point really is that resistance emerges from the life of history. It emerges out of the everyday textures of people's lives. Those decisions to join, those decisions to engage, those decisions to act come not from the broad framework, but from those individual lives. And you have to engage with them to understand. But of course, you have to take account of the, the memory factor, the distance factor. That those life histories are shaped by an encounter between past and present, and part of that is the interview itself, the moment when you're cool. And so, understanding of resistance is shaped by the contemporary meaning of what resistance is. So Rob was working post-1968 in France, there was a return to the an understanding of activism, of grassroots politics and the importance of this, and it was through that lens, through that filter, that he was then looking back at the 40s, thinking about the meaning of individual agency and individual engagement. So the, the encounter uh, with the present, the memory of that event, reshapes the, the historical understanding of resistance. So what we get out of this then, is that this archive of resistance testimony is dedicated to two things. It's about the preservation of individual testimony, of those historic acts of resistance, but it's also about thinking about that relationship between the past and the present. A historic moment is understandable in relation to other historic moments and in relation to the present. So there's a commitment to investigate acts of resistance across different times and different places. And again, this is where testimony comes in, because these are the points that we have. So, that's what we're engaged in doing, and so far, I, I mentioned Rock Edward, he's offered um, uh, about 100 interviews that he, he undertook. Um, we've had offers from uh, Martin Cox, who's a filmmaker, who's done about 90 interviews with people involved in various aspects of resistance. But we're extended out, we've had a, 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 a just received a mass, massive amount of material from Elizabeth Woolpert's family, she was a filmmaker and part of the anti-apartheid struggle in the 1960s and 1970s. We've had offers of material relating to uh, opposition to wars of decolonization and to the Black Bush experience of the Nazism in the 1960s and 70s. So that you know, there's not a shortage of interest in this. So that's the archive resistance testimony. So 
what about making it a digital archive to come back to the original? So I now want to talk about the practical issues that are really in terms of getting this material into the archive. And it seems to me that digital, I was drawn to digital because it seems to offer some, uh, a nice solution. It suits a policy of preservation and conservation. And it accords with this policy of making this material accessible to the widest possible audiences, researchers, and project So, you know, in terms of the project having a research dimension, a teaching dimension, an outreach dimension, it seems that digital presents solutions for all that motivation. So you can see what I want to do. And so I've come up with my practical goals for what I wanted to do for each offer. So each offer testimony should be digitally preserved in the most faithful and lossless manner possible for conservation. Each offer testimony should be available digitally in a form that maximises accessibility, but preserves the intellectual property and copyrights of the donor and all the interviews and copies there. We'll talk back in the question. And then finally, each offer testimony. These are it's largely audio material, but we're also getting visual uh, as well. So there's a process of transcription, which is necessary to turn this material into searchable, researchable data. So that's important. So what have I, in trying to do these, is, again, I've got, I drew up this list. I thought, this is very easy. What's the problem? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some of the issues that have dropped up. And the first of these is the, the format rules. Now, because this is a historic collection, the various media on which these testimonies are recorded simply reflect the history of technology. <coughs> so this poses a problem when that medium simply becomes obsolete. I'm not saying anything to the revolution here. So the Walpert collection, for example, covers interviews, rushes, pre-production edits, finished films, um, still photographs as well, across at least six different forms of video and tape. Um, I'm not sure that the university has the means to even play it. Um, I was offered interviews with resistance people on micro cassette, someone who could use a dictaphone in the 1980s. Um, I couldn't find a way of listening to those anywhere on campus. Um, and you can still buy micro cassette transcribers, by the way, but they cost between 250 to 500 pounds. So I ended up buying one on eBay. So it's but of course the risks are really, you know, what if this is a machine is faulty and it destroys the tape? More amusingly is that the tape is so often, and two of them turn out to be answer machine tapes, because the donor had no need to listen to them, so you put them all in a box, and one turned out to be an interview with something very interesting, but there's nothing at all to do with it. So you only discover those things once you play. So the format issue is quite a problem, um, just in terms of recovering the original data. But there's an ongoing issue, you know, technology isn't standing still. In terms of the formats we're choosing for digital conservation and preservation, you know, there's a risk that we become future victims of this format more, and that the, the, the format becomes obsolete and then in some future date inaccessible. So, for unfavouring for audio and open source uh, lossless format like FLAC, which I, and for um, uh, video, I'm only just finding out about this this week, something called Huffy UV, which is apparently a, a pretty much, you can't do lossless transcription from an analog source to a digital source, but it's as close as you can get. But, and because they're open source, I'm hopeful that, you know, at some future date, even if the, obs the formats become obsolete, we'll still have access to the new formats so they can be made accessible, rather than using a proprietary format or a closed format, which has other risks. Um, for making the accessible copy, so we've got the, the preserved copy and the accessible copy. The accessible copy will obviously be um, a lossy format, so it can be compressed and be smaller and be more accessible. But, you know, here we're coming up against infrastructure and minutes. Um, we're kind of, I mean, I don't know what the latest stage of this is fair, it's, it's always ongoing, but we're kind of working at the moment on quite a traditional model of keep thinking about, well, if you access a paper archive, you call up a box of material, and the box is still in the tube desk, and then you read it. So we're thinking, well, at the moment, that's a model we could probably do. You, the digital interview is delivered to a researcher at their desk on a USB or a CD or something, and they just plug it into a sample or not. Now, obviously, ideally, we want some kind of uh, access to a central server with um, uh, a workstation access to this server, some kind of uh, uh, web front or shop front or kiosk front through which you can but all that's costly. It's not, you know, for a relatively small collection as it is at the moment, it's probably really good stuff with the conditional model. So 
that's where we are in terms of format wars, in terms of accessibility and so on. We're a long way off uh, actually solving some of these issues. The second is, is much sort of more about the intellectual approach. And here again, um, you know, my thinking is a really early stage, and Tim's in the room, he's obviously you know, the, the expert on doing this kind of thinking about how you organize online sets of data and his work on the London Lines and the old baby online accounts on that project. So any any advice here would be really appreciated. Again, at, at first I thought I was rather naive when I started but if you transcribe everything, you just sling it into a, a database and then it's full text search for the you are. But full text searching is actually very inefficient for researchers. It re returns lots of false positives, it's very ineffective, it's very imprecise in terms of setting up the research time. So then we come on to keyword searching is really the way to solve this. And again, that seems relatively straightforward. If you're dealing with a body of material where the historical is very clear, so if we're just dealing with French resistance in the Second World War, for example, then it makes there are a certain number of keywords and themes. The historical is mature, it's well developed, it's been going for 30, 40 years. We can set up a you know a, on that material a set of searchable keywords that will be understandable to researchers. But come back to the point of this project, not to reinforce those uh, contained understandings of resistance that are limited in time base, but to break down and cut across the So suddenly I'm faced with coming up with a set of keywords that allow that trans-historical comparative approach. Now any list that I come up with is bound to miss something out because I'm, you know, we're actually that kind of comparative research is relatively in its infancy and it's actually being pushed more by people in philosophy and people in global studies than it is by, by historians. And this is where the archive, the will to preserve, starts actually becoming an intervention in history itself. It's actually offering an interpretation. It's now you can argue that just the decision to set up an archive and just test me is an act of interpretation. But we're now at the point where I'm having to make decisions about the shape of the archive that reflect ongoing historical work. So I, I guess we're really coming back to the, um, the bigger picture in there. To make those decisions about metadata, about organising the, the data, the research has to be in place, the, the comparative understanding has to be in place, and, you can be in place, and the two can't really be divorced or separated. So that's where. Thanks. Thank you.